Hey, what's up guys? Back here with another video. Uh, we're going to do something a little different today. Okay. We've been doing a lot of programming lately and a lot of Atari lately. And I've got something here that's a little different, being that this is a channel that's dedicated to 8-bit computers, not specifically Atari. As I said in the first video that we were going to be doing 8-bit computers, that could be consoles, it could be Atari, it could be Commodore, it could be Apple, it could be you know anything that's 8-bit. So without further ado, I want to show you guys something I have here. This is an Apple Macintosh, okay? And uh, I'm not sure what year this Macintosh is from, but it was given to me by a family friend. And we're actually going to take this thing out of the case, take a look at it, and uh, see if it works. And do any repairs that we need to do on it, if necessary. And... As you can see here, here's the keyboard. It's uh, yellowed, as you might expect. It's an old machine. What's nice about these original Macintoshes is they had a carry handle right here on the top of the computer, where you could actually lift it right out of the carrying case. And uh, here's the power power supply for it, the brick. Actually, no, I'm sorry. This is the uh, three and a half inch floppy disk drive for it with uh, Apple's connector, which is some sort of a serial connector. So you can see here, we've got the Mac, three and a half inch floppy disk. It's got the keyboard plug on the front. I've got here a box with the, uh, I'm assuming it has the original accessories that came with it. You can see there, it's kind of cool. It says Macintosh and kind of like embossed letters here. A little Mac logo. Okay. It's plastic, by the way, this case. So if we open this up, you can see here we've got original little pamphlet, Macintosh pamphlet. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see that. It says on the back, the adventure begins. Caution, do not open the Macintosh case. There are no user serviceable parts inside. Okay, good piece of advice. There's the original color fold out of the Macintosh in its glory day. Kind of cool. All right, so we got that. We've got the original user manual. If I hide my head, maybe it'll focus in on that for you. Okay, this is pretty cool. All right. So we'll take a look at that as well after. Uh, original Apple Macintosh, circa 1984. All right. 8 megahertz, 68,000 processor, 128K of RAM, 56K of ROM, a 400K internal drive. Um, this, the Apple Macintosh was introduced on January 23rd, 1984. This particular machine was brought home on January 24th, 1984. So January 24th, 1984, this machine was purchased and taken home. Uh, by the individual that, that actually gave this to me. So I don't know if you can see inside the box here, we've got the power cord, we've got the plug for the keyboard, we've got the single button mouse, and we've got some three and a half inch discs here. Um, we've got a system disc. It's pretty old if you can see that. Hide my head, maybe it'll autofocus for you. Three and a half inch Macintosh system disc. Okay, looks like we've got Excel, Excel 1.04, okay, Microsoft Chart, Mac Paint, um, and Mac Write, Mac Write 2.2. 
Good stuff. I'm not really sure what this uh, little plastic thing here says, interrupt, reset. We'll figure that out. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and plug all this in and we're going to power it up and see if it works. And um, let's see what happens. So it powered up, which is a good thing, but if you notice that the vertical position was a little low on the screen and the floppy disk, even though I tried to put it in, it, it didn't actually take the disk all the way in and drop it into its uh, position where it can then start reading it. So we're going to have to take it apart and we're going to have to fix those two problems and hopefully we can get past those and we can get the machine booted. So let's go ahead and take this guy apart and see what we can find with the floppy drive. Let's start with that. All right, so the first thing we have to do is we got to get this thing taken apart. So we're going to go ahead and start with the two screws that are on the back of the case. And I apologize for the blurry video, but it will correct itself here shortly. So the two screws in the back, and those are going to be followed up by two more, which you will see in just a second once I figure out that the cabinet is not coming off just with those two screws. So let's get the right screwdriver and then maybe we can get those out. These are a Torx 15, by the way, if anybody um, embarks on this uh, project. 
P15. We'll get all the screws from the case out. I figured out there's probably another screw or two holding this together. So <laughs> let's try and figure this out. Where is that last screw? Oh, here we go. Maybe behind the battery door. All right, now with a little uh, pressure and a little brute force, we should be able to separate this back cover from the machine. Just be careful when you're doing this because obviously these are old machines and there's very sensitive equipment inside. So just take your time, it'll eventually separate. Now on the inside the cover of this machine, the actually etched into the case are the signatures of all the original Mac team. It's a little hard to see on this uh, video, but trust me, they're there. It was kind of a cool thing. Um, if you can take some time uh, one day and you actually have one of these machines, you can take off the back cover and read those signatures. And you can see here, here is the model number M0001. And these machines actually did not have any serial numbers associated with them. This is the first of the first for the Macintosh line. Okay, so now we've got the computer case apart and we can see the various components inside here. Um, comes apart pretty easily, as you can see. And there's your high voltage power supply. We've got the uh, lower voltage power supply on the bottom of the board. This is our internal floppy drive. Very dirty inside, might I say, dusty. And then on the bottom of the case, we actually have the motherboard. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, target the floppy drive first. Uh, but more than likely, we're probably going to have to disassemble the, uh, the bottom of the Mac before we actually can get that floppy drive out. This motherboard actually comes out very easily. One connector for the floppy and one connector that controls the uh, power and the basically the power to the uh, to the motherboard and that's uh, pretty much it the signal to the CRT as well and it slides right out I mean it just doesn't get any easier than that here's a top view of the motherboard you can see right smack in the middle of that beautiful 68,000 processor and right above the processor we've got the bank of RAM the 128k of RAM There's the main power connector right there and some other low voltage ICs, voltage regulators. Um, the back of the board is all your communications. There's your Apple computer logo, 1983. That is your keyboard connector to the left. So now that we've got the motherboard out, we can get the actual floppy drive housing. There are three screws on the bottom chassis that hold that um, case in for the floppy drive. So we'll take those three screws out and get the floppy drive out. And we'll unplug the floppy drive connector and there you have it. The three and a half inch floppy housing that we can now focus on and work, in, work on it independently of the main machine. Now I believe we have four screws that are holding this uh, drive into this actual housing. So we'll go ahead and take those off so we can access the drive mechanism by itself. Now my theory all along um, for this drive mechanism, as with most drive mechanisms, is it's mechanical. In other words, there's old grease and lube 
that has dried over time and hardened and become sticky, which is usually what happens. Plus the fact that it's dirty and full of dust. So basically what we're going to do to correct, take corrective on this drive, at least as far as the first phase, is we're going we're gonna to blow it out with compressed air and we're also going to clean up all the moving parts and all the moving tracks and the assemblies with uh, isopropyl alcohol. And uh, we're going to see if that corrects the problem to begin with. And you can you can see here that as I put the disc into the mechanism, it does not drop, it doesn't move back, it doesn't take any action that it normally is supposed to do. And I can feel it already. I can feel that everything is hard and crusty, and doesn't want to slide properly. So that's that's what we're going to focus on first. We're going to just clean the mechanisms and blow it out and clean it real well. I can start to feel a little bit as I'm cleaning it. Just a little bit of cleaning that I'm doing that it's already loosening up and moving more freely. So I'm going to keep working on this and uh, continue to get a lot of this old grease and sticky compound um, out of the mechanism. What I've done is I've reconnected the drive to the main board and powered everything up just to see if the little bit of cleaning that I've done is going to give me the ability to boot the computer. Now when I insert the disc it's dropping into place properly and the head is engaging and I can, I can hear the drive spinning. So let's see what we get. We're still unable to read the disc, and I'm not sure if that means that the actual disc is bad or if the um, drive is still not reading properly. So what we're going to have to do is I'm going to have to get a known good system disc that I know that boots properly so that we can isolate and determine whether or not it's my disc or the disc drive that's still not functioning. As an additional uh, measure, I went ahead and cleaned the drive head with some alcohol just to make sure that maybe there wasn't any dirt or oil or grease on the drive head that was preventing it from reading the discs. So um, it didn't ultimately help, but um, I went ahead and cleaned the drive head anyway. It seemed pretty clean. I didn't get anything on the uh, cotton swab. What's up, guys? So here we are back day two of the Macintosh restoration project. We didn't make very good progress on the floppy drive because I'm still waiting for a disk to come that I ordered online so we can check the drive and see if it works. However, we're going to focus our attention back on this guy. This right here. This happens to be the power supply slash video board for the original Mac and as you guys remember, the display is cut halfway off and um, it's not functioning properly. So I was out online talking to some people that had restored these before and they recommended that I go onto the back of the board <clears throat> and resolder all of the major components uh, just to make sure that they haven't come loose over time. It's a pretty old computer, so we're going to do that today. And if that doesn't work, I ordered some components some capacitors, um, some transistors, and a couple other pieces that are known to fail on this, on this board. So while we wait for that disc to come in, we're going to focus on seeing if we can get in this board to work so we can at least have our video screen full size on the screen, which is right now, it's cut in half. And from what I've read online, it's the vertical drive circuit. Um, it probably has the problem that it's not allowing the um, the the whole gamut or the width or the height of the of, of the screen. Probably an RC resistor capacitor circuit or a capacitor that's gone bad. So uh, I'm going to start off by just retouching most of the solder joints that um, I've been told that go bad, and then if that doesn't work, we're going to replace these components and hopefully it'll it'll be working again. So. So what I've done here is I've got the board out of the machine and I've got my solder and iron heated up and I'm going to go through and start touching some of the uh, more important joints that connect 
the flyback transform more, the connectors that uh, control the power to the board, and some other recommendations that were made by um, <clears throat> other folks on the on the net that have dealt with restoring these Macs before. Um, there's some RC um, components on here, resistor capacitor components that have known been known in the to have cold solder joints, um, you know, after a certain period of time, after sitting for a long period of time. So uh, I'm just going to go through and um, I'll speed this up. But I went through and I touched up, you know, 20 or 30 of the uh, more important joints that were talked about on the internet. So we'll get that done real quick and then we'll move on to the components. Now, some of the more important components that needed to be replaced or that I had been told that needed to be replaced and also reviewing the, the schematic are there's a couple op-amp ICs that are in the video um, drive circuitry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace them first and um, then we'll get into the, uh, the few discrete components that um, I ordered as well, some capacitors and um, some resistors. So. I'll go ahead and speed this up just so you can you can watch me as I'm desoldering and putting the chips in. Now, I apologize, guys. I uh, somehow missed video capturing where I replaced the capacitors, but uh, I will go back and show you a picture of those that I replaced. So here we are. I've got the Mac back together. I've got the board back in. And what do you know? We have success. As you can see, we've got a full Mac screen. There's a little bit of space on the top and the bottom. Uh, we're going to adjust that here shortly, but <laughs> In general speaking, I mean, it worked. You know, there was obviously either one of the op-amp ICs or one or more of the capacitors, you know, working in conjunction in that vertical drive circuit that, you know, was causing the screen to, um, you know, not have that full height. But in any event, that's a success in my book. 
So we're gonna go ahead now and adjust the uh, focus rings in the back or the, the rings that control the yoke position. And you can see that you can move the display um, up and down and left and right ever so slightly uh, using those rings. So now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the height and possibly the voltage. I think the voltage is good though. I think our width is good. I think I'm only going to adjust the height here. So very carefully using um, either a plastic adjustment tool or a, a straight screwdriver, um, I would suggest putting it on the glove to make sure that you don't get any high voltage you know, surprises while you're reaching into this high voltage area of this board. But there's a potentiometer we can turn that will um, control the vertical the vertical height of the display and that's what we're going to adjust here. I want to get the height just a little bit you know closer to the edges uh, and get it as, as, as tall as possible you know tall as possible without it you know bleeding off the edge of the screen and you can see there we got quite a bit of an adjustment that we were able to make and um, I think probably I'm going to use those rings to move the vertical the entire vertical screen or position down just a, uh, just a hair um, to get it centered on the CRT. Hey guys, what's up? So we're on day three of the classic Mac 128K repair slash refurbish. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am that we were able to fix that vertical size problem. Um, we replaced probably six or seven capacitors, um, a couple resistors, a couple transistors, uh, two MOSFETs. And I want to show you guys the schematic that I used to determine what components to replace. Um, this area here on the board is where I focused on. As you can see here, there are several components that I replaced. The two ICs, U1 and U2, which are op amps. And then C10, C5, C6, C11, and also Q1 and Q2. Uh, these are all components that I felt you know, could cause the problem that, that were weak points in the design. So um, those are the ones that I focused on, and obviously it helped. And we actually have the display working properly. I want to show you what I got in the mail just yesterday. Um, I don't know if you remember earlier in the video, I told you that we were troubleshooting the disk drive, and we had gotten the mechanism to actually drop by cleaning the rails and some of the slide mechanisms from old grease that had dried and crust it up. So um, once we got that working, you know, the mechanics of the drive, I tried to put the original discs that came with this Mac in and it wouldn't boot. So I wasn't, I'm not really sure if it was the disc or the drive mechanism. We tried cleaning the head, that didn't seem to help. But what I did get in the mail is from uh, a gentleman in France. He actually had the original 400K operating system disc. So I got it in the mail. Let's crack it open and let's see what we got here. So I don't know if you can see this Macintosh system disc. Hide my head so it focuses on it. That's a 400K disc. So we're going to see if we're going to put the disc drive back into the Mac. We're going to see if we can boot it with this and see if we can actually get the Mac to work. Hopefully it does because I really don't want to troubleshoot the disc drive anymore. So hang tight. All right, guys, we're back. I've got the Mac pretty much put back together. As you can see, we've got the floppy drive mounted back into the system. We've got the power supply. We've got the yoke connected, the flyback. Um, we've got our mouse connected here. So what we're going to do is uh, I've got the system disk in. Let's power this guy up and see if all our hard work paid off. Ready? We've got the tone, which is always a good sign. We've got a happy face Mac on the screen. Welcome to Macintosh. Yes. 
Our mouse works. It's booting. And we have our system disk. So guys, it worked. Now, I'm gonna lay out all the components that I replaced so you can see what it took to actually get this Mac back up and working, at least as far as the display goes. And then we'll talk about the disk drive just for a couple more seconds after. Let me lay these components out so you can see. But as you can see, we've got it. I know you guys are probably seeing a rolling screen, but if you can kind of look closely, you can see we've got our classic system disk. We've got our system folder, an empty folder. We've got our disk copy utility. We've got the fonts menu, notepad file. Let's go ahead and go ahead in the notepad file. Well, now it can't be found. I wonder why that didn't load up. Let's go into the system folder. You can see the finder, the system, the clipboard, this graphic file. So the Mac is definitely working. And you can see our display is pretty, pretty even around the sides. We don't have a lot of keystoning going on. We probably, well, maybe we have a little bit of distortion here, which we can adjust with the rings in the back. Let's go ahead and go about the finder. Macintosh Finder version 1.1 G, copyright 1984 Apple Computer. Bruce Horn and Steve Capps. A little bit of history there for you guys. So we'll do a little bit later on. Um, we'll go over the, uh, the Macintosh Classic on another video. We'll go ahead and review the software and how to use it and some of the, some of the things you can do with it. But So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, I appreciate you sticking around as I go through this journey of restoring this Classic Mac. I hope you learned something. I hope that you can find your own Classic Mac, whether it be the 128 or the 512. Um, if you can find one cheap. You know, pick it up. They're not hard to work on. They're easy to disassemble. And it's really a, a nice piece of Apple history that you can have and you can enjoy it yourself. So subscribe, like, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.